like second to write. So this is um, um, this is this is actually my fifth collection of poetry, which is kind of overwhelming to think about, and I'm so yeah, so grateful. Okay, just to, this is my only small commercial for the book, and then we will move on to the thing that really matters, which is poetry. So this book is for purchase here at the lovely bookstore, and I would encourage you all to read it because it doesn't just um, sort of encourage me to keep going as a writer, but it also keeps your local bookstore open that provides opportunities for you like this. So, so um, the book is a, a collection of awkward love poems. Um, they're woven between a longer poem about my love affair with a woman's severed belly button, which is a true story. Um, but then it's like kind of intermixed with, uh, I would like to say they're more normal love poems, but they're not. Um, so um, I'm going to open up the reading really quickly from a book uh, for, with a... <laughs> with a poem from the book, and then I'm going to introduce what it is we're doing here tonight, which is a whole love game. I'm very excited about it. So this, this poem is for Mike. He's my guy, and he did a lot of work to help me get here tonight. And uh, this is the love poem I wrote for him. So this is Love at 42. <laughs> so awkward. All right, Love at 42, Dating as a Single Mom. Nothing says romance like a good horror film. The giant blue heart painted on the white walls of the Cecil Hotel looms like an anti-moon from your balcony. Such a vortex. Windows looking into windows. Taste of human flesh in your tap water. Signs all read, pick up your dog poop, but ignore the tent cities without toilets. Where do thousands of people go when real estate agents put on a pub crawl? Does it strike anyone else funny that the word is real estate, as in property makes all things tangible? The scariest films are those where a family gives everything for a home that wants to devour them. The witch pulling at a child's foot that wandered out from under its bed sheets. I couldn't leave my bed between the hours of midnight and 3 a.m. after watching The Conjuring. Dead mothers repeating, she made me do it. What have we ever done on our own accord? Such a witch makes Rosemary's rape seem campy, even sweet. I guess I choose to spend every other weekend getting scared with you, cuddled up and regressing. We all want to be the babies sometimes. So, thank you for clapping, it means a lot. Um, so there's these little game cards. So if you would like to play and don't have a game card, I will hand them out to you. So what I did is I collected my favorite poets in Los Angeles, and I asked them to write a love poem to each other. So this is like a whole host of, I think, LA's finest poets tonight. And um, they have written love poems to each other. And so there's a little scorecard on the back, kind of like playing a game of Clue. And so you have to match which poet you think is writing poems to each other. And then we have a bonus round, because there is kind of an unrequited love poem story in this one. I will come around with like other game cards if you're interested in them. And uh, yeah, we'll get started. Oh, oh, I forgot. So your fabulous prize, should you win, will be a free copy of my new book and a $20 gift certificate to the bookstore, because we're trying to support the local bookstore. I'm very excited about that. All right, so now that you know what's on the line, um, I am going to just randomly ask up whichever poet I see first. <laughs> oh, Lori put her hands up. Lori! Lori! Take the mic. The poet who's up here is going to read one poem that's from a new project so you can get to know their voice, and then they will read a second poem, which is the love poem. So it's a, it's basically like the, the dating profile and then the actual date, right? All right, good luck, Lori. <laughs> Nikhil, congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. One more round of applause for Nikhil. Woo! Are you guys dating? You and? Oh my god, that's so exciting. So excited. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Lori Badikian. Nice to meet you. And um, I'll start with my poem, my own poem, and I'll end with my, my, um, <clears throat> you know, the other poem. 
Um, so this poem is forthcoming in my second book um, titled Jagada Kid, Apology to the Body. And it's going to be published in September of 2024 uh, by University of Nebraska Press. Thank you. I'm so excited. I'm, so, I'm more excited about that than the person I'm paired with because, oh my God, wait till I tell you about the date. Uh, <clears throat> I'm totally kidding. <clears throat> So this, I dedicate this poem to all people who need to escape something for either their own safety or for the betterment of their lives. If only he had written his refugee song. If we broke the cliche in half and home was not where the heart was, but instead where your body intended to remain, that machine of pulse and memory, skin its largest organ, the intricate map of your life in sunspots, a chosen few which began on farmland in Lebanon, some which formed during walks along the lost apricot orchards of Cupertino. Then perhaps you should have trusted that broken chassis of yours trusted all angles of it and moved it across floor, shuffle until you began to walk again. How quiet the house became when you refused to sing. I entered thinking I'd find attempts, but there you sat in silence. Any tent is paradise for the one who has lost everything. The flap of its mouth, a makeshift threshold, the canvas walls, boundaries of light. I told you to forget treachery, but your bifocals, skillfully useless, came on and off to read the news to remind you of what had once been home to you, to kin. I told you to tuck displacement in the wicker basket, but you had faith in nothing except in the failing of the world how we hoped your limbs would burn like red dwarfs. Your mind would forget about highlands and forgive the half-wits on the pages. But you rested in place. Your mind drove the road of the body to pieces, your hands grasping at nothing but the splintered air. Thank you. I wish you all wellness. May you all be well and all you love and admire and may you just all be well. I got, I got chills all over my body, like when I sent that wish out to all of you, okay. <clears throat> so this is the poem to the person you have no idea who it is, right? <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Note of admiration, not in the voice of Gertrude Stein, but in, oh, this is the title. So the title's really long. Don't get confused. <laughs> no, no. So, so the first line, I'll give it a long pause. So it's a really long title, and then I'll give it a long dramatic pause, and then we'll go into the. <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> Note of admiration, not in the voice of Gertrude Stein, but inspired by. Gertrude Stein because I'm smart enough not to think I could write something in the voice of. Long dramatic pause, look at beautiful Nicole, continue. <clears throat> Our childhoods may have been bagels, books, or bombs. Maybe books and bombs. Mine also had bagels. Our childhoods and books maybe bombs, maybe bagels. Our childhoods may have been, may have been, may have been. Like this, I am not your secret admirer. Not your secret, not your admirer. Maybe I'm lying, like a bomb, like a book from childhood, like the center of a bagel. I love similes, like I love admiring nothing, sometimes no one. But I'll say it again, I'm not your secret admirer, not your admirer, not a secret. Bombs are dangerous. Childhoods can be dangerous. 
books not, bagels not. But I'll say this, admire yourself. Never admire a secret. This one's called Toast to the Fool, 1983. They kissed as if each other's mouth was the cure for a disease they both carried for so long they forgot they had it. A disease no doctors could spot, a sickness that was beyond the eyes of their cousins, aunties, uncles, their grandmas, their grandpas, their mamas there. They both didn't have no daddies. They kissed as if the kiss was the last thing they would ever do with their lives, as if the horns of the inn were loud in their ears, the ground shifting below them, about to take them forever under. They both could always see the ends of things, the lastness of last always on. A dead daddy is a long, 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 long song. They kissed as if they were free, as if the color of their skin didn't scar a target around their bodies, as if the law couldn't make them crawl, police with their guns drawn, their bodies sacred and safe instead of scarce and sacrilegious. They kissed, they kissed, they kissed, they kissed, they kissed, as if music saves, as if love saves, because it does. Let's hope it does, it does, it does, it does. It doesn't. This is called Beard Envy. How I long for a full one. How I wish my mustache didn't live on a different island than my goatee. How I wish for their way to be fluid and connected, the way the beach is the sea, the sea, the beach, separate but one entity. Please give me unity is what my face says, is what our country says. Well, used to when our dreams slumbered in the same breeze instead of on separate IG pages, DM boxes, and stopwatch TikTok time. I'm lying. Our dreams were always isolated islands. It's a dream, a fiction to think otherwise. A full beard to show my age, what I've learned, the gray hairs I've earned. A full beard soft to touch and caress and thought. A full beard scented with musk and beard butter. A full beard to catch soup and crumbs. A full beard to block autumn's numbing winds. A full beard so I can look fresh, powerful, grown, gorgeous, glowing, towering, just like him. Anything but this bald, awful face I was born in. Thank you. So the, the title is the first line of the poem. She'll do anything for food, the dog walker tells me. She speaks quietly not wanting to insult her heavy-boned, one blue, one brown-eyed beast tugging at her leash. We did a doggy ancestor test, she confides, discovered she's part wolf, part miniature poodle. <laughs> Must be the poodle part that makes her so ravenous. Small creatures are ruthless feeders. Think of enraptured rats gnawing their way through orange trees, babies nursing, sucking so fiercely they can burst a nipple. Think of your heart, size of a throbbing fist, the part of you that will do anything for love. Fingertips, tap, tap, tapping, typewriter keys around the world, his words pouring onto the page like cinnamon tea, rose water, purple elixir, blood for wanderers whose lives he'll irrevocably change. Would he tell us it's simultaneous? His fingers keeping time with his heart and mind, images flashing like lightning during an unexpected LA storm. Tap, tap, tapping, giving so many his poetry which flows like a stream from a picture book lake. 
his eyes blue as a kiddie pool filled with toys, eyes that lock into the eyes of strangers who give him just enough clues to offer them the gift of their own stories, wrapped in seaweed or floating in a wine glass, fingertips tap, tap, tapping secrets of their lives they have yet to discover. I have a poem for you. It's called Exorcisms Are Like Bad Sex. This doesn't belong anywhere, just in my phone. <laughs> I have been a part of two exorcisms. One for my aunt's home after a motherly ghost wouldn't leave until the laundry was folded and the floors scrubbed clean. But in a house with three boys, she would never be done and never set free. We prayed and prayed as a priest for hire drew her from the walls with sage and relieved her from her duty. The other exorcism was mine. I knew my father was desperate when he brought me to church instead of taking me back to a traveling witch doctor who wrote me a prescription and filled it herself. I learned that exorcisms are like bad sex. I laid myself down and several men laid their hands on me. I wondered if this was their first time too. But when they spoke in tongues and whispered the same lines, I knew they were virgins. I laid there, willing for it to be over just as soon as it started. In moments of silence, I opened one eye and saw them quietly putting in work with a face of determination. The session ended. The oil they anointed me with ran down my face and no one brought me a towel. I looked them each in their eyes and thanked them for such a moving time. And like all bad hookups, I promised to see them again. <laughs> This poem, for this lovely person that's in this lovely space with all of us, is called, You're Cute Enough to Make Narcissists Look Twice. Oh. <laughs> I know, uh, I work on anybody. So, <laughs> I sat at the edge of the Colorado Lagoon and winked at my own reflection. That is, until a bird plucked my face out of the water and flew right by you. The water could have rippled for ages, I wouldn't know, because in that instant, I belong to you. I heard you name every shade of green in the foliage. I saw you beat your eyelashes fast enough to help a dragonfly practice its first dance. And after a while, I knew why your shadow craved every ounce of sunlight to be by your side. By the end of the afternoon, I understood how these moments were your gift to yourself. I went back the next day and saw you there again. But this time, I watched how the earth gifted things to you. I heard the trees stiffen up as you walked by. I saw how excited the birds were to perform for you as your binoculars panned over to them. I felt the temperature shift to give you a breeze softer than a whisper and cooler than an iced chai latte. I went home that night ready to become a wedge. If I could get between you and the earth, I would have enough love for centuries. I went back the next day and you weren't there. I stood in the space you usually occupy and I waited and I waited, and I was jealous of your shadow for never having to wonder where you are. I asked the trees for your name, and they guarded it when I told them I wanted to sketch our initials into their bark. I walked over to the water and hid it with an open palm because the reflection I saw was not of us. Frantically, I brought soil to the water to create mud because I knew that I had to sculpt your face in that moment or I'd lose it forever. I combed the grass hoping to find your hair or a toenail, but the four-leaf clovers got in the way. The birds hovered over me before flying away in all directions, and I knew they went to tell you how much I loved you. I just wished they flew in the same direction so I could follow them. I waited for the night to hold a possum ransom, and it was worth it because it gave me your name. I found and messaged you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, LinkedIn, and AOL, but no reply. So here I am to ask you today, is your Hotmail still working? say night bend, I mean the hyphen in my name shadows my soul. I walk with the death camp strut, a tripping menace stuttered in my mouth. At night, my nipples bursting like an open sun, a ghost tarred with grief while I piss on the names of my captors. My father sings to his mother from his seventh moon, 
which is to say his sadness is a cemetery silence crawling up the city like an unwanted bra in summer. <laughs> At night, a river can slit your throat. I can make God out of balloons. I can prove to you that a book is made of your mother's spirit. And explosions are evidence of a blooming belladonna. I mean, anything can happen at night. Enemies sleep together, mixing strands of their blood for a half child, half empire. The book inside me unlocks the fortress of my shame to break out the characters held in your hands. If you sing my war name, then I will be as alert as a forest of redwoods on guard against the accommodation of cabins. I mean, anything can happen if you read to me. I'm telling you, anything can happen at night. When my inner life split in half, I was a semi-breed with prison blood lurking in my cells. My therapist says, work on your inner child. But laughter from the resident alien boy glimmered in my green card. I am free. I am free. Thank you. Okay, so maybe there's a poet that's not here. And maybe you could look at the little teeny tiny faces on the postcard and figure out which poet is not here. But that poet sent a poem. And so I'm going to pretend like I'm that poet who's not here. And I will, like, bring in the spirit of this poet. Okay, so this poet wrote, <laughs> we don't know to whom, uh, Rebel. A burst of pink fuzz, cartwheels in from New York on the headlines breaking news poetry. Broken lines around a meddling wall, the price of gravel on Sundays, 1979, 1994, 20? How sweet to demand nothing more than occasional heartbreak. To dress up color matching, we learn that from the dead. Learned, breathe from its absence. Drained the absence. Got cotton candy, spent ourselves. Two quarters for parking. Is that half? Don't be whole, so boring. Be the sum of fractions. Ditch home. Each time they divide you, grow new limbs. The camp for trees in the backyard is a parade of ants. In this life, you can be the parasite or the host. Keep walking, stick bug. You're so fancy. Even the trees are jealous. Yeah, that's pretty good for a ghost poet. Woo! Made a book, and uh, you should buy it because that's how poets stay poets. <laughs> There's a section in the book of Awkward Love Poems where I used to write in the middle of the night to a poet on the East Coast um, who, he had these rules, like there was no love affair other than we both love poetry and we'd write these love poems to each other, um, but we had rules. We couldn't write directly to each other, we could only write to each other's bones and we could only do it using random facts from like you know, Guinness's world record book and stuff like that. And so, as poets sometimes do, this poet disappeared. And we never know what happens to poets that disappear. Some of them fall into volcanoes, that's no lie. And so, I don't know if this one fell into a volcano, but I published my side of our two-sided conversation. So this is a one-sided love poem to Bones. So these are, my, these are my love poems to poet Peter Schwartz. If you're out there, you should email me and let me know you're not in a volcano. The guy that, re the guy that fell into a volcano is um, Craig Arnold, who's one of my favorite poets, and you should buy that book because he's not here to tell you to buy the book. So <laughs> he fell into a volcano, so okay, all right, here we go. Dear Maximilla, it's your own teeth, not me, who left you an empty mouth. Useless. Fact. The American Revolution was nearly lost because of Washington's oral decay. Red coats intercepting George's love letters to his dentist would read, send more morphine to location X. British bullets would then travel to X. 
Consider your loss a gift of infallibility. Young men will not die because of your toothache. I have suckled your gold replacements. Your new smile substantial as honey. However, nothing can replace pulse. Part of you, now artificial, bites like a machine. George won the war when he gave up his bones. Will this be a love letter when I give you up? I haven't given up on you, Peter Schwartz, so if you're not in a volcano, uh, email me. And everyone buy Craig Arnold's book, because he's in a volcano. All right. So uh, a poet I never want to fall into a volcano is Jeremy, so you're up next. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I mean, when I was, you know, not too long ago, I was really new to the scene. And, um, Nikhil has just been my support friend throughout everything. Um, I'm, I actually got chosen to be one of the poetry that I host based on the one conversation that we made. And um, here's a little story about that one. That was actually the second tape because the first tape they forgot to turn the audio. <laughs> so we got we forced ourselves to get drunk again, like <laughs> around 11 a.m. And we're like, yeah. And people are like, what? so much fun about poetry. What's so fun about poetry? I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so behind all of our naked emotions, we are writers. We actually do know how to have fun. I mean, I think we can kind of see that with all of like, the lineups here, right? Um, and I want to read this poem because uh, the title was suggested actually by Nikhil. I got lost and ended up posing as a watermelon in this painting. I posed for him with all my glee because that's what I was told to attract attention. I polished my impregnable big rind, my shame averse skin that even hippos need an iron jaw to break. When I crack a smile, it is chiseled. I'm not easily bent in whims or sins. Yes, you could almost say I am happy, happy enough to grow in my oblong as a tear that cannot drop. But when I see myself painted through his digging eyes, I am blue, many heavy shades of blue. Less a balloon than a dire drag that rings in the nether regions decibel like drum or bass. I grow heavier on the page with each stroke. I pose for him still, letting my rhymes go slightly bestial, slightly dull. I spread like an ever-dipping web that nests a coarser paint. His eyes rope cinder blocks around my ankles, for we have stared each other into the ripples of nothing upon nothing. If I had a mouth, I would marry my grief to his. Mm. And here's my love poem. <laughs> the Dolphin. The bartender pours a drink into a glass, above the tremorous whiskey line. A self looks back like a distant memory. She always knew but pretended not to know that one day she would measure the rings of her life by the songs of those who are no longer here in places that are no longer here. Her heart feasts on the before and the was. The bartender pours another drink. She recognizes but doesn't these arbitrary reflections she assumes. Was there something liquid beyond the stairs just waiting for her to dive into a pool of bated breath that, that will carry her? She feels the water overcome her. A thousand selves built upon a million selves birth her grief. She placates the unforgiving currents with her flippers like a piano trill. Her fin a mirage that swallowed the disaster. What she drinks is a tide unbroken. For in this life, it is she that swims endlessly toward you. Thank you. Dumb luck. The car crashed. You were in it. You weren't in it. Two died. The car crashed. No one was injured but you. There were soldiers on the side of the road. You were alone. You spent so long trying to unwrite your body, but it's the body that you're left with until it isn't. Your friends are gone. Your friends are called bodies until they aren't. You were lucky. 
The car crashed. Two died. You weren't in it that time. You don't believe in luck. You share a bed with each coin's flip side. You flipped the car and crawled out of the morning. No one died. The car crashed and you decided to stay home that night. You hate how obituaries say survived by like it's lucky. The car spun upside down and you counted the clouds until the grass caught you. The car crashed and that glass wasn't for you. You don't believe in luck, but what else are you left with? There were days you wished to disappear and didn't. You choke on the luck of it. The car crashed, you slept through it, they died. You drove away and crashed into your life. You walked away from the crash site, but the rest of it you're stuck with. The car crashed, you keep waking up, and every time they die, you crash and crash against the dumb luck of your body until you're not sure how many crashes there actually were. The world spins, and you keep counting the cracks in the windshield, wondering what will catch you next, what it will try to break your lucky dumb bones against. Oh, And this is my secret love poem to someone here. Um, it's called Ode to the Wilderness in Us, and it begins with an epigraph from The Little Prince. You became responsible forever for what you have tamed. So you grow wild and wilder with wonder. Look at you, so lucent there, swaying alone to your nostalgia in the middle of the dive bar where the stone tiles grip our souls with the sugared grit of other people's messes. And we raise another glass to forget our own. You who trade in the currency of cocktails, confess to me that your love language is a free drink. And why shouldn't it be? This city is a scavenger hunt of every bar stool and dark corner you've refused to be tamed in. Another way of loving what death doesn't claim. You light another cigarette as we traipse down sunset. I envy the way your veins glow feral in the brake lights. Yours is a story that always begins with burning. How you learned to take what was thrown at you and dance amidst the glitter of shattered plates. How you singe and sharpen until even the night can't keep you. The way you make even the stalest Tuesday taste honeyed with freedom for you, uncaged and still singing. The next round is on me. The Boy from Bel Air, after Vinod Kumar Shukla. There was a boy in the fountain who was always a ghost. The fountain had a mansion with tall, white pillars. I drove there in my beat-up Camry. His mother made frittatas in the morning, and everyone loved her. He went home to a bed and clean sheets. He never had to work at Macy's during the holiday season. The boy took an imaginary knife to my stomach. His best friend wanted to make a bracelet out of my knuckle bones. I saw it. The boy had a demon living on his tongue, a jester in his ears, and a popper in his heart. He flung me around like salt, and I licked him up like salt. I invited him over one time, and we slept on the floor. Gave him a taste of Kmart, and he spit it out. He spit me out over and over. Over and over, I became a freeway leading only to him. 
I saw him in my dreams. It was so special. There he was, an apparition in a fountain. I never stopped loving the shape of his mind, even after he was through with me. I cried my way to the gates and pushed them open with my teeth. I rammed my bullhead hard into the horns of love. I became the patron saint of myself. Years later, I talked to him on the phone. He still suffered from his father's bruises. He was stuck, didn't even try to climb out of that fountain. Meanwhile, I kept swinging up the monkey bars. I found someone who cleans the house with me. Ideas turn alive when I touch them. Dreams pour out of me, waterfalls of dreams, dreams dreaming of other dreams. I sent him a basket of dreams for old times' sake. He was still a boy, and I was the rich one now. Oh. <laughs> Here's my love <laughs> Okay, here we go. Let me find you. <clears throat> Let me find you sitting alone at Dolly Parton's stampede dinner, the Smokies' most fun place to eat the world's most visited diner attraction. Binoculars out, sneaking peeks at phone screens in between bites of biscuit and potato. Let me find you driving free and fast from Cali to Philly, windows down, music loud, swaying with the clouds, nowhere in particular to be. Let me find you spinning forests of metaphors with Grandma Licho, biting words into bits, eating language like a Happy Meal. I want to find you somewhere you love to be, lavishly reveling in others' losses at the bingo halls and casinos. I know I'll find you in the nosebleeds at a concert, spying on those down below. Or maybe I'll find you at the local cafe, doing a crossword puzzle while eating pancakes and eggs. I'll find you there and deliver this letter to you, my love. My lovely, my liquid-tongued labor of love, I love you, do you realize that? Wherever you are, I will find you. Wherever you are, there I am, binoculars in hand following your every text, my love, following your every step, because I love you. I know you don't know me, but I know you. <laughs> I, will, I will find you again and again. I will watch you from afar as I do every day. My pining, my desire, my longing, my binoculars are very good. Sweet one, if I throw you my heart, will you catch it? <laughs> there once was flowers. There once was flowers sprouting up from every corner of my grandmother's yard, with butterflies and bumblebees delicately harvesting the nectars and pollens across the yard. There once was flowers like camellia bushes anchoring the porch, providing beauty and privacy in the spaces separating the inside and outside of my grandmother's home. I would sit on that porch as a child in the cool breeze of late summer nights, waiting for something as I watched the low twinkle of the steam plant in the distance. There once was flowers like the line of roses leading up to the twin bird of paradise trees that created a tunnel to another world. A world where my grandmother would sit midday on a shaded stone bench, reading Daniel Steele novels after gardening for hours. There once was flowers and fruit trees scattered across the landscape of my grandmother's yard, like the fully grown avocado tree that towered over portions of the house that I climbed one day and was too scared to come back down without her help. There once was flowers like the blackberry tree that was ripped out to make space to park one of her kids' very old motorhomes. She said it was fine, but I heard her cry softly in the bathroom later that day. There once was flowers before the home renovation projects she did not want had her sons stepping on and ripping out anything climbing the edges of the house. 
because it was easier than working around them, and she could just plant more. There once was flowers, before the dementia took her memory that there was ever anything but barren dirt. Before the days my grandmother was not allowed to garden in case she would wander off or get hurt again. There once was flowers strewn across all and every open space in my grandmother's yard, but now her gravestone is covered in flowers of every kind. Every time I come to visit her, I read her something new. Mm. Um, the Keeper. The earliest known practice of scapulomancy dates back as far as 1600 BC during the Shang Dynasty, where the shoulder bone of an ox or tortoise was heated until it cracked, revealing a fortune, or sometimes a misfortune, written in the bones. And he could feel it in his bones, those years that held too much for any man, let alone a child, undergoing so much fracturing and healing. But written in his bones is a family story that he carries on his shoulders for those that can't anymore, for those he wants to honor, that he wants to remember. Like a vinyl record, those heated bones carry the ridges and grooves of all the songs his parents danced to in courtship. They carry the stories of a life cut too short and another locked away for follies of youth and those who came to pick up the pieces. It's as if those shoulders were a pair of rhythm bones holding the beat of the blues that is the song of his life, both joyous and sorrowful in nature. As the keeper of his family story, he will uphold their songs while he slowly writes his own and adds it to the vinyl collection. Okay, okay, all right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have lasted this long, I don't know if you know this, but you have made it through an entire chapbook length worth of poetry. <laughs> And you would think that it was over, but it's not quite. So there is a poet that is missing, but then another poet said, I love this other poet more than the other poet ever could. And now we're going to see if that's true. <laughs> Hannah! <laughs> it's so great to be here. Nicole is one of the most interesting people, and I'm excited about her book. Okay. <laughs> First one, introduction. Welcome to my dating profile. Please come inside. In this photo of me, air kissing a mural, you'll find the living room. Look at those curves and high ceilings. I do not have a lifelong disease. In this photo of me practicing yoga, you'll find the bedroom. So many outlets. Look how flexible I am. Imagine us trying positions together. I am not in chronic pain. In this photo of me pushing off a wall, you will discover that when I laugh, it ricochets from my gut to your gut, a trick of light. We have reached the balcony. I am not on antidepressants. I am not here, I am just an experiment for you, an example of wanting. I am not tears, I'm a myth, like love or astrology or hell. I'm a room of stasis without real plants. I'm waiting to be cut short from growing, from breeding, from going off and on the house the pills, your body. Come play with me. My heart is a stuck sled in the middle of a sand mountain. I'm whatever pill I try asks me to be. Whatever spot you find is yours. There is no parking. Okay, this one, I wrote it very recently, but I'm excited. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> A cadence is missing without you. 
Itching means living, which is why I need you to help me escape my body. I want your black bangs, the sound of coins and velvet from the tongue to sift over me, but instead I reach for a hand that isn't held out. What does it mean to love yourself while also wanting the world? I want eyes made of fire, but to come through blue twirls, convincing, unmoved, and welcome. Does it matter how long I listen to an alarm before turning it off? I want love to mean something more than the moment before distance. You guys did it such a great job. Okay, so my final poem is two lines. It's how the book ends, but it's belly poem number five emptied, and it says, still I am sorry and still I love you. So, okay, let's see who won. So if I could have the couples come up and stand next to each other and look lovingly into each other's eyes so we can have a photo op at the end and find out who the winner of the contest is, that would be fantastic. So if we could have the couples come and look as lovingly at each other as you possibly can. So here's your secret love. Oh. Oh, there it is. I need to touch it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll get out of the way. No, no, we're working with Yeah, you have to get back to the front.